The Power Factor Show with Rick, Steve, and Caleb. Episode 68. You can find this podcast and others at Gun Rights Radio Network, gunrightsradio.com, podcasting freedom. Brought to you by Safariland and Hodgton, the gunpowder people. Welcome to the Power Factor Show. I'm Caleb. And I'm Rick. And today we are talking about... Well, we're we're talking about this, and I I'm a writer, Rick. I'm not a mathematician, so why don't you tell these fine people just what the hell is going uh, on? This is kind of part two of our uh, course design. Uh, we started out with kind of uh, discussing kind of what we like about courses of fire and kind right. of the requirements of courses of fire, what makes a good one and a bad one, and which aspects of good and bad we like and dislike. And so we're going to kind of do at least this one segment that gets kind of into the nuts and bolts of stage design. Uh, I've been shooting IDPA since uh, about 1999, and I've been match director for uh, 10 uh, sanctioned matches, so I've seen a lot of stage designs, and so we're just going to kind of start at the basic level of where you begin your stage design process and just kind of walk through it. If you're new to stage design, it'll kind of give you a leg up on... I find a lot of people will be able to get as far as, hey, I've got this idea for a stage. Right. And then turning it into something that's actually legal and workable is is kind of difficult for people. That is, no, that is actually the hardest part. And different people have different methods for it. I actually, I have a very hard time designing stages for bays that I've never actually been in. Yeah. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm visually oriented. So if, unless I've been in a space, it's really hard for me to get a feel for how that stage is going to be set up in that space. Other guys can, you know do that yeah and what what we're referring to here which of course you'll see magically appearing on the screen it's it's a, essentially a map of one of the shooting bays at my club uh, we've had people go in there and essentially do surveys of each bay we know the width the depth um, locations of any kind of obstacles uh, our bays are set in kind of a almost like a forested setting so we've got a lot of trees and whatnot so if you're going to design a course of fire you've got to take into account these kind of geographical and geological sometimes mm -hmm. uh, issues with the bay. And the bay in which uh, we're going to design a stage has some interesting um, kind of issues with it because your typical shooting bay that you'll find in most clubs is either square or rectangle right. uh, with, a, with a earthen berm at the back and on the sides. And you can generally shoot through up to 180 degrees. Uh, this particular bay that we're designing the stage for has concrete ecology blocks serving as the side walls on both sides. So essentially all the rounds have to go directly down range. And so that provides, you know, kind of a consideration for uh, you can't have high angles of fire from the um, initial shooting position. As you go down range, you can get some sharper angles, but that's one consideration. The other thing There's is... There's also big-ass trees in it. Yes. Uh, the <laughs> illustration shows the, the six or five smaller green diameter, uh, green round indications on the uh, illustration are actually trees that are set in the middle of the bay. Uh, the large green circle is kind of a mound of dirt that's got trees springing out of it. And um, sometimes we'll use that as a cover position and sometimes we'll just use it to get in people's way off to you know, just kind of negotiate around it. But as you'll see, anywhere you put targets in this bay, depending, in fact, this is a bay that we saw in my last match review uh, video in that uh, we are using, the, we were in that uh, instance using the trees to kind of uh, create a situation where as you're moving across the bay, targets were appearing and disappearing because of their uh, proximity to some of these trees. If you were standing on one side of the bay, you could see the whole target. Mm. If you were standing on the other side of the bay, it would be completely hidden behind the tree. And so that's kind of cool. But then, of course, you also run into issues with bullets impacting the trees. Right. And we actually uh, damaged a tree with gunfire sufficiently that we had a windstorm. The tree fell over. I, think I you remember were at that. that match. I, that, I remember that. Might have been that, the first yeah. match you shot at Renton, maybe. That was one of the earliest. It was probably the second match. And I remember there was a big tree laying on its side. And I so was like, I, that's... I think in this drawing, it's actually the, the, the tree that's kind of up at 10 o'clock in the top mm -hmm. left corner. That one has since fallen over. But yeah. anyway, so we're designing the course of fire for this stage or a stage for this bay, and we've got to take into account these concrete walls on either side, and then we don't want any rounds impacting the trees. Now, the trees can be handy as cover positions, mm -hmm. built-in cover positions. You can say, you know, this is the start position. You have to reload behind that tree, and that works out pretty well. But the course of fire that we designed in this case um, kind of works around the trees. 
So yeah. what we have is this, which you will now see behind me, uh, projected in pure 3D glory. Get your glasses on, kids. And it won't actually be in 3D. Uh, I have to ask, uh, what the hell is that thing? Uh, that is a baby. And so for what, what, I'm talking about this thing right here. <laughs> Not that you can actually see what I just did, but if the, he can, our producer's pretty good. So. Now, one of the things about IDPA Courses of Fire uh, is they have a scenario. Right. And that kind of drives uh, the action. So let me read you the scenario Burned for out stage. on scenarios. I'm going to have a drink while you read that. Okay. You built your camp. This is a camping stage. You built your camp a bit too close to nature-loving meth makers. And your fun and frivolity has attracted their attention. An unwelcome visit by the chemists and their guard dogs throws your vacation into a tailspin. Rescue your family before the ripping and tearing starts. So as you can see from the illustration, we've got uh, the, the so-called chemists are represented by targets T3, T4, chemists. and T7. And their dogs are uh, represented by T1, T2, and T8, or actually T5, T6, and T8. So the targets that are down close to the ground at an angle represent the Did dogs. you cut them at all? No, we just lowered them down to the ground, and I think we put some black cover on them, uh, maybe just to uh, reduce the likelihood of rounds skipping off the deck. Related note, is it just me, or has there been an upswing in popularity of stages where you're shooting theoretical dogs? At our club, we shoot dogs, it seems like, once a month. Let's rephrase that but <laughs> yeah i don't know nationwide if you guys are, are finding a greater and greater incident of animal incidents at idpa matches let us know yeah the power factor show now sponsored by michael vick yeah we've got uh we've had stages in this particular bay because it is fairly heavily wooded <laughs> we've had stages where we had like a bear attack you know the same kind of a deal where you're camping laying out under the stars and a giant bear attacks you so one of the things that was kind of interesting about this stage is there's nothing in the rule book that says because a target represents a dog you don't have to take cover from it that's true and so we had some fairly lively discussions as, as i mentioned in the in the power factor episode about uh, match production uh, as match director, I must have my stages approved by my area coordinator for right. a sanctioned match. So just because I'm not really sure why I'm taking cover from a dog, uh, my area coordinator was absolutely certain I have to take cover from a dog. So uh, dogs... Uh, and Laser part, beams. Part of the stage design actually was driven by that. Um, if you'll notice, T5 and T6 are behind a short wall. And that's so that you would be covered from these dogs. That seems... All right. Yeah, I mean, it's I've, kind of a little bit of a workaround, you know. But. I've seen stages where it actually said in the stage description, targets represent dogs, cover is not required. Yeah, and so it just depends on how the thing's laying out. Yeah. Now, this little weird-looking alien by the tent that says Buzz, um, when we do stages where we've got a doll that represents a baby, for instance, in this case it is a baby, it's a small Buzz Lightyear doll. Ah, and so it says buzz. buzz. Yeah, and so anyway, you can see by the layout of the stage, you start at position one, mm -hmm. seated at the table, the picnic table. Um, one of the members of your family here is uh, attacked by the dogs, T1 and T2, and then the, the uh, action flows from left to right. Mm -hmm. But of course, as you're moving from left to right... Did you design this stage? I did. That's interesting because it is set up very well for a right-handed shooter, but not a left-handed shooter. And that's a consideration of the bay layout. Ah. If this were just a, a square bay without the trees, I would have run it probably run it the Reversed, other way. Reversed, yeah. Yeah, but again, that's a man uh, just a, a, of having to work around the way the bay is set up. It essentially had to start on the left side. Interesting. And if it was going to flow down range, and it does. I mean, it moves from left to right, but it also flows down range um, because as you're moving across, the the rounds still have to go straight down range so you right. avoid hitting these concrete walls on the side which will stop a bullet but it's kind of bad for them yes uh and, and and at this particular range one of the local range rules that we have is it bullet hits concrete wall you're gone and so um we were very particular about the the rounds going down range and even even to the extent of things like um something that people don't often take or don't always take into account on a course design is if you've got a target that's engaged from one position and it's visible from another position, are you allowed to re-engage it? Mm -hmm. Well, on this range, once you've moved from the start position to the right, if you were to re-engage it, those rounds would You'd pass be... it through it and hit the wall. They and were... so 
uh, no re-engagement of T1 and T2 after you've left the start position. You see that a lot. I've shot a lot of IDPA at indoor ranges as well. Exactly. And so you're got, familiar with yeah, that at your Absolutely, because you can't, you know, if I'm at T3, well, I can see those targets from T1 and T2, but if I shoot them, I'm going to put a bullet into the baffles. And they, they tend to frown on that. They do. They do. So besides just uh, accommodating the physical layout of the bay, there's the other considerations of a maximum round count of 18 right. per string. Since this is a one-string scenario, of course, of fire, maximum of 18 rounds. Um, there's a ratio of no shoot or non-threat targets to threat targets. It's being, seems like constantly now modified. It was clarified recently. It was. Re-clarified. It, it used to be, I think they just said three to one. Mm -hmm. And now they've, they've changed it a little bit so that I think if you have between four and six targets, you're allowed two, two no shoots. Right. So this the ratio here is um, we've got one, eight to two. So clearly it, it fills You could have actually had another one in there. Yeah, under yeah. The new clarification, which may be clarified again. And you never know how many yeah. times it's going to be clarified. It's um, all so clear now. Yeah, so we've got a ratio of uh, non-threat to threat targets. Also at a sanctioned match, there's a requirement that a certain minimum number, I think it's 5% of the shots fired must be fired on the move. That's right. I forget about that. And the rules addendum allows only shooting on the move in an, from sort of like an initial position right. that's out in the open to a cover position. You're sitting at a card table. You've got to shoot on the move while you fight your way to cover. Right. Exactly. And essentially, so the situation we have here is T1 through 4 are in the open. You mm -hmm. don't have any cover. And so you don't actually get to a cover position until you're at T5 and T6. Do you have to pick up the baby? You do. That's the other thing. So is, you're shooting those last targets strong hand only or uh, yes, shielding exactly. the baby? Yes, There's. I think there were fairly specific instructions. Uh, it's one of the interesting things about IDPA is, is that when I'm designing a course of fire where you're carrying your baby, mm -hmm. you're expected to carry it like it's a baby. <laughs> in USPSA, if you were to pick up the baby, you'd see people put it in their teeth, mm -hmm. you know, they'd stuff it down their pants, I, you know, whatever it is that holds it up off the ground that allows them to get their shots up. I once carried a baby, and they said you had to carry it in your weak hand. So I carried it in my sport hand, but whenever I got to shooting positions, I just jammed it down in between my legs and shot yeah, with two and sometimes hands. they'll say you only have to carry it. Right. Other times they'll say you have to be holding it while you're shooting. Right. You know, or there's different requirements I've there. seen it say where you have to shield the baby, and mm. you have to shoot like this, protecting right. the baby from incoming fire. Yeah, and then we've had courses of fire that are similar to this where the baby has to be, you know, deposited into a, a crib or something. And you'll see somebody who wants oh, to toss the baby. Touchdown spikes. You know, right. Oh, those are the best. And so, so we actually, great to throw one a time we actually had like a two paragraph description <laughs> of what qualified as placing the baby. You know, if the baby is released while the foot is more than four inches from the surface of the, you know, it got kind of complicated. But, you know, it was essentially the idea is this is a baby, treat it like a baby. So um, you've got to ha handle the prop, um, and the tent is kind of interesting. Um, you've got to provide a place to reload at least, or at most, every six rounds mm -hmm. for revolver neutrality. Now, if you'll notice here, we've got uh, two rounds on T1, two on T2, three, and four. That's eight rounds. Well, any guy who's got a revolver is going to be in trouble. Here. Right. And so what we decided to allow, I believe is that you may reload at the desk, at the start position, and you can reload in the tent. So if I was shooting a wheel gun, I could go one, two, three, four, do a tack load with a wheel gun, and that, that was my option? Wow. Well, but everybody else who's shooting a revolver is stuck in the same boat. Uh, yeah, I just... Uh, as, as my area coordinator said, the revolver guys are used to getting messed with. They really are. Did anybody <sighs> maybe have a, throw a mic on T1 and T2 and so. then make it up? I don't think up? so. No, it, it's, it's <laughs> interesting. We've One of the things we've wrestled with on some of our courses of fire is there have been opportunities to abuse the layout of the stage mm -hmm. versus the rules. Like on our 35-yard stage, we determined if somebody fired just like blaze 12 rounds into the berm, they would probably finish in the middle of the pack hmm. because you total up the penalties and people who are actually trying to hit the targets aren't really doing They're a whole lot longer, better at 35 yeah. yards. And so, but I never saw anybody that it seemed to me was trying to get the benefit of not shooting their best. I mean, because hypothetically, if I were to be shooting a revolver, purely hypothetically, of course, if I were shooting a revolver on that stage, I know my fastest reload's about three seconds, and that is a quiet, that's a smoking revolver reload for me. Mm. So 
uh, it's going to take me 0.4 seconds extra to shoot a down three into that low, you know, the low, the obviously I should make this shot up section of the target, mm -hmm. then shoot two down zeros, and then do that the same thing on the other. Hypothetically, of course. Right. You know, right. I, I, I just think that's a very interesting, I think a tack load at the desk is a very interesting solution to Actually, that Actually, in reading it here, I should have made sense of this drawing. It says, reloads me, it doesn't really change anything. At position two. Which is the tree? Okay. So you can. It's still the same issue, though. You could fire four rounds, get to the tree, do your reload, and then continue. Now, what could you fire four rounds? Could you fire? So, and I'm sorry, I'm stuck on this revolver thing because yeah. I think this is fascinating. Sure. So, say I fire six, can I run back to the tree, reload, and Let's then see. come back? Let's out see what and it eat? says. That's the other thing. You need a well-written procedure. Yeah. We've heard our scenario. Well, let's look at the procedure since we've seen the drawing and we're chuckling on about it. At signal. Draw and engage T1 and T2 while moving to cover of position two. So okay. I really blew it. All shots fired while moving. So four rounds moving on the way to cover. For sure. Okay. From cover, engage three and four. Oh. Retrieve well, baby with solved. weak hand and engage. And, and again, this is one of those things about course design is, you know, I read, I drew this thing and redrew this thing five times. I'd send it, I'd, I'd look at it and I'd go, oh, there's nowhere for the revolver to reload. And I draw it up again. Turns out there is. I would put these, I mean, initially, I think T3 and T4 were on the other side of the tree. You know, and, and so it was like, you know, this isn't going to work. And, and then finally, I had to get the area coordinator to allow as how this maybe was a Kevlar uh, tent and that you could reload in it. Because normally you wouldn't consider a tent to be covered. Right. But more like concealment. But since, you know. Since we hide behind A plywood plastic walls. and cardboard wall isn't really uh, cover either. But um, so, uh, yeah. All right, then. So then uh, you retrieve the baby with the right. weak hand. So now you're holding him, clutching him by his skull. Right. Now, the interesting thing about this stage is it was a fairly tall tent. It was one of those kind of dome tents where the entrance was about five feet high. But some people were concerned, you know, they're always at a trip hazard and whatnot. And so we went around and around on, do you require people to go through the tent? And I said, well, there's no reason for them to have to go through the tent. The most direct route is through the tent. Mm -hmm. But if they feel like they're going to slip or trip, they can go around. So it just says, retrieve the baby. Now, it's so a how, What percentage went through versus Every single went, person. Went through yeah. it? Yeah. It was essentially a straight line between position two and T5 if you went through the tent. Okay. And so you would, you know, as you were making your beeline from the tree to T5, it carried you through the tent, picked up buzz. And then, of course, um, you retrieved in the baby in the weekend, engaged T5 and T6 while moving to cover of position three. So the position three is this low wall that mm -hmm. allows you uh, to view and engage T5 and T6. Um, those targets are engaged strong hand only, all shots fired while moving. And again, this was kind of a this was kind of a hybrid course of fire because it had actually been designed originally in 2006. And we had to add elements into it to make it comply with, with the, rule the rules addendum. And so, based on my reading of the uh, rules addendum, I think this is kind of a hokey stage um, because you're essentially firing two, four, six, eight rounds and kind of running through the woods to this position of cover that's literally, you know, 40 feet away. Um, but it, I think it complies with the letter of the rule because. From your initial engagement, you're shooting your way to Yeah, but cover. now that I got my kid, why don't I just get the hell out of here? Yeah, yeah. And, just and, a thought. Yeah, and it was actually, it was more fun before, but I, the whole theme of the match was let's redo these stages from past matches. Mm. And I really wanted this one in there because I think running through the tent was really cool. And so it was just like a lot of the stages are, you, you, you'll you remember stages for a certain feature. Mm -hmm. And on this stage, running through the tent to get to the baby was the feature I wanted to preserve. And so uh, I, I went around and around with the area coordinator. I think there was actually a couple of calls to Robert Ray um, before we got this one straightened out. But anyway, so the procedure carries on. All shots fired while moving. Then from the cover of position three, uh, engage T7, T8, strong hand only while maintaining baby in weak hand. Reloads may be performed at position two, which is the tree mm -hmm. between T2 and T3. Uh, while moving from position two to retrieve the baby, that meaning in, essentially in, in the, the tent, tent. Um, and at position three being the edge of the wall. What uh, did you do with the baby if you had to reload? Could you like set it down or throw it under an uh, armpit? It, or? It, it says um, you, it, it requires you to hold the baby while shooting. 
from cover engage while maintaining the baby. So okay. you were allowed to put the baby down for a reload or a clear remote function. Here you go. Yeah, and put down, you had better. I mean, we had, yeah, it, this was not a stage where we specified the manner in which the baby the was baby should be. So that yeah. baby got dropped is what you're saying. Yeah, I, I don't know how many people dropped it, but um, anyway, so the course of fire, uh, a lot of give and take on how the thing is laid mm -hmm. out. Um, but essentially you've got your uh, rounds on the move, your rounds from cover, intact priority, and you get to the end and you've got your dog and your guy that are shot statically. And um, so I had to take into account my total round count, which is 16. So that's within the limit Legal. of 18. Yep. Uh, and the thing that's kind of cool, not to get too far afield, but there's a, there's a tool for helping stage designers and I don't know who made it, but it's like a, a spreadsheet. Mm, and you mm. punch in how many rounds there are, how many of those rounds are on paper, how many are on steel, how many are moving, and how helps. many no threats, non threat targets there are. And you get to the bottom of each column, and essentially it'll, a green check will appear oh, cool. if everything complies with the rules. Very cool. And it'll do the, all the stages for an entire match. And it, it will, so it will essentially you get to the bottom, it'll go, oh, I've got one too many non threats on mm -hmm. stage three, or uh oh, only 4% of the rounds are shot while moving, you know? And so this thing essentially does all these calculations for you. And if you're running a big match where you've got 10 or 12, or in this case for this match, I had 16 stages, keeping all that stuff straight is hard enough, but to have this spreadsheet that essentially does all these calculations for you uh, is a big help. And so, hmm. uh, so the stages are all laid out. Uh, we, had our, we built our tent. There was some concern that people would trip over the entrance to the tent. Um, you know, it's got the floor, Right. Uh, that's integral to the, the dome. And so if you don't have the corners and everything perfectly laid down, It'll the entrance will kind of curl up. Yeah. up. So we nailed some two by fours into the doorway entrance and exit to, to help prevent people from tripping. I have actually tripped in tents like that. Yeah, when you're camping or when you're shooting? Camping. Yeah, okay. Um, and so uh, working out all these details, fitting it within the physical dimensions of the bay, and then checking off all of your boxes about, um, you know, again, the ratio of the no shoots to threat targets. If you've got steel, is there enough? Is there too much? Um, if, you've, if you're requiring head, uh, head shots, that's seven yards. Mm -hmm. Strong hand. No, head shots can be up to 10. 10. Strong, strong hand is 10, right. weak hand is seven. Yes. And so you have to fulfill those requirements. Which means technically you can have a strong hand only head shot at 10 yards. Yes. I have seen that in yes. matches too. But a weekend only headshot would have to be seven. Seven yards, yeah. Yes. So anyway, again, you have to take all this stuff into account. And then of course, I think it helps to have a good story. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think the, this bay, we've used the little camping scenario, the dog attack scenario more than once because it looks like you're in the woods. And so these little scenarios that uh, involve like hiking, camping, mm -hmm. it, it's really well suited to that. Have you ever been to an IDPA match where they did the whole match as a story? Because I've actually been to matches where they did that oh, stage. Like, like the story continues from stage yeah, to stage? Like stage one is you're dropping your kid off at daycare, and then as you're driving home, you get mugged. And then stage two is, you know, you found out they kidnapped your kids, so now you're going after these guys. Cool. To get your, yeah, they did, like, this whole, like, Taken theme. And it was actually yeah. it was actually a pretty bitchin' match. But, that is cool. That uh, is it, cool. Very, very rarely do I give a rip about the stage scenario. And if they skipped it entirely, I would... If it was eliminated entirely from IDP, I wouldn't shed a tear. Mm -hmm. But... Every now and then, totally worth it. And that was one of those matches where it's like, now I'm glad that I read all these scenarios. Yeah. Um, other things to consider when you're laying the, the, the stage out is, for instance, T1 and T2 are shot while seated. And so you want to make sure you've got the height of the target mm. set so that any rounds that pass through the target, at, at our range, we're really anal about no rounds hitting the deck. Mm. Um, I've shot at ranges where the nearest civilization is 100 miles away. So they don't like, even have birds. You know, like, you're shooting whatever. into the horizon. Uh, but we've got a, a rule at this range that all rounds have to hit the burn. And because if a round hit the deck and skips. Exactly. Yeah. And it's unlikely, but we don't mess with it. The club where we used to shoot, where my, my club originated at a range 30 years ago and shot there for 20 years, um, and the range was shut down for a year uh, because of a round that escaped and you know broke a window at a house you know a mile away, and so we're as especially our IDPA club we're really conscious of rounds hitting the burn, and then likewise if as you're transitioning from sitting to engage T1 and T2, then you're standing to get engage T3 and T4, and um, you know I've 
set up targets that I think are fine, but then I have somebody, uh, let's say, shorter than I am, and when they shoot at that, look at that target, well, boy, if I shoot at the down zero zone, I'm fine, but if I shoot at the head, that's right at the top of the burn. Yeah. So you've got to take that into account. And sometimes we run into situations where, you know, we'll, we'll paint everything on the target below the down zero zone black yeah. so that it doesn't go into the ground. I mean, you can't absolutely prevent it. But Just people aren't going to be shooting going into for the that, exactly. For me. And then by setting the target at the right height, even a shorter shooter could, could if they wanted to take a headshot, and everything's still going to hit the burn. Yeah. And that, for us, is probably the single most important part is ensuring that those rounds hit the burn. And that's another concern you'll see if you sh if you set up stages of an indoor range, uh, they don't want rounds to hit the ceiling. Sure. So and we've had stages at uh, ranges that I shoot at that are indoors where you know uh, the tall guy who set up the stage is like, oh, you you know, two to the body, one to the head, and then I sit down and I'm like, we have a problem with that because yeah. I'm going to shoot the ceiling and they hit a sprinkler and then we're all going to get really wet. Right. And the other thing too is uh, if you're designing a stage where you've got you know targets at a variety of distances, generally we'll put the target that's most distant from the shooter right up against the berm and then build everything out from mm. there. And um, in this case, uh, T8, T6, and T5 on the far right, those targets were set right on the ground, right at the base of the berm. So you could just shoot You could just lean down over into and shoot them. right down out. Cool. And, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, and then of course you've got your uh, engagement sequences. If you want targets to be engaged in tack sequence, you must specify. You must specify. And I was kind of surprised that it does not say engage T1 and T2 in tack sequence. But you're not supposed to mix tack sequence and tack priority well, at the same when stage. But when you're sitting at the chair, that's true. That's true. No, but, mind you, you're not supposed to. It happens. Oh, yeah. yeah Lots. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, I think. Uh, we do mix tack sequence with tack priority on the same stage, but certainly not on the same array or the same group. I mean, not right. the same group of targets. I think we touched on in our stage design episode that we did the first one, where there was a stage where they said engage in tack sequence and tactical priority. And you're like, what? Yeah. So it's Which like shoot the nearest target first, then the second nearest target second, then with the distant, one round, most right. distant one third, and then come back. You know, and, it, and you're not allowed to do that. No. Um, if you say tech sequence, it means I get to pick whichever one I want to shoot first. <laughs> exactly. If you say tech priority, I don't get to pick anymore. Yeah. So be mindful of your uh, impact areas. Um, be mindful of um, shooters of differing height. We've also had stages uh, where you're required to shoot a target around a certain side of the barricade. Mm -hmm. Because like on a bay like this, if we had a barricade set up, um, and the angles to T1, and, the T1 and T2 are right up against the wall um, on this diagram uh, where the lower left tree is, the one that's kind of at seven o'clock. Um, the targets were right near that tree. And so if you, let's say, had a barricade at the, where it says 30 feet, which is measuring the distance from the back of the bay to that tree, and you shot around the right side of the barricade, it's possible that rounds would go into that concrete wall. So if we had, a, let's say, a barricade on this stage, we would say, you must shoot around the left side. Uh, on this stage, as it's laid out in the drawing, by forcing the shooter to stay seated at the table when they shoot, you, you're dictating the angle. They're, they're not gonna get off of an angle enough that they can hit that sidewall. Okay, cool. Yeah, and you can also do stuff, I mean, you know, with barricades, shooting through something, ports, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, to, to, to direct those, the angle of fire the way it needs to go. Sort of a related stage design question. Uh, I don't know if you saw the most recent episode of Top Shot on history. I haven't seen uh, it yet. But they had a moving port that you had to shoot through. So the elimination uh, challenge was you had to shoot targets. So it was like through halfway this... between you and the target? Or? No, it was like right on top of you. So it was oh, like shooting okay. through a porthole, on a, uh, like a window, and it moved on a track laterally, and the so shooter you're had to going move along with it right. back and forth. And it mm. actually. And I was like, I, I looked at that. I'm like, I want to put that in a match. Like, I think that would be a neat thing to put in a ma in a USPSA or an IDPA match because you know, could an do IDPA it. IDPA match, it would be like a you're passing. riding on a moving train and mm -hmm. are being the trains a, moving relative the, to you. The, no, you are moving. So you're shit. It would have to be you're standing on the on the platform, right? And you're shooting at somebody on the platform on the other side right. as the train goes by. Exactly, and you have to keep pace with this train exactly. as it's moving yeah. All because shots that's your be position fired of cover. Before the platform, exactly. There you go. There you go. Moving windows in Next IDPA. World shoot. Make it happen here. Yeah. right here. Okay. Um, and and that's the beauty of the scenario. I right. Mean, I think you can you know, justify anything. You can design the stage and then write a scenario to fit, like mm. we just did. 
or you can design a scenario in this case you know like the name of the stage is uh, campground contretemps and so the idea is of course you're at the campground and bad things and happen. there's some contretemps going yeah down. exactly and so you know it's like i i had this idea of okay you're camping out in the woods and you're sitting at the picnic table and your tent's over there and so what's going to happen oh okay there's dogs but why are there dogs it's the meth lab, right. you know? And, and of course they have dogs. Exactly, of course they're in the woods, you know? <laughs> and so it's a plausible scenario, it's fun, it allows you all, you know, all kinds of variety here. And I think that's one of the things about the scenario is it can lead you to creating, like we've had stages where you're supposed to be hanging on a San Francisco cable car, you mm. know, while you're shooting, or you're, uh, you're on a bus. We had this one cool stage where we had like rows of seats set up and you're supposed to be, uh, there's like a terrorist that's festooned with uh, oh, yeah. dynamite or whatever. I remember that stage. You know, and just stuff like that. And you can come up with, and, and as long as it's plausible, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't have to be something you're going to run into every day. It doesn't, even have, to be, it doesn't even have to be plausible as much as it has to be justifiable. We had a stage where just. you started. The ends what, justify the means? Absolutely. Right. This, this was the start position for the stage. Okay. Head down. You're a security guard. No. Oh. Uh, you are, uh, a, you, you wake up in a public toilet stall in Mexico after your bachelor party. And you had to pick up, a, and it, the whole stage was with a pickup gun. Okay. And it was, you, so there was, and you, you st as you stumble out of the stall, you see a dead security guard who'd been shooting it out with drug lords. So you take and his gun. you pick up his gun and okay. shoot your way through the stage. Right. But I just remember sitting there like this, and you know, some guys had fun, had a lot more fun with it than others. Like one guy yeah. starts the stage, he's like, and it's shooter ready, and he goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we had a stage like that where we we debated whether or not we should string a bungee cord between the shooter's feet, like to simulate their pants being around their ankles. <laughs> so I think decided, somebody would have fallen on we their We decided ass. it was a safety issue hey, and didn't do that. Speaking of stage design things, I saw a stage on YouTube recently that I questioned the legality of, and I wanted to ask you about it, completely blindsiding, on uh, the show tonight. So, here's how the stage starts. There's a buzzer. You have to yell something at the targets but not shoot, and then there's another like buzzer. Like you'll never get the bank money black part. Right, kind of you'll thing. never take me alive, you right. know, whatever, or put my daughter, you know, what? I don't sure. even remember what it was. I just remember thinking there was a buzzer, and then there was another buzzer that was your indicator to start shooting. And if sure. you shot, even unintentionally after that first buzzer, because you've been doing this for 10 years, and right. you hear a buzzer like, crap! Right. Uh, it was an FTDR. See, that, that was the face I made as well, because that seems <sighs> awfully harsh for an unintentional, like if I shot, if, if there was- the Well, and I don't think it's an appropriate penalty. Right. The, the FTDR is supposed to be, I mean- If there was the first buzzer and I shot half the stage? I mean, technically, the rule says, if you're trying to circumvent the kind of the, the right. theme, or trying to, you know, kind of- Cheat, get, if you're well, cheating. Cheat, cheat, yeah, but boy, I mean, in a, in a sense, you're getting an advantage from disregarding the, the instructions. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that the penalty is awfully disproportionately harsh for the nature of the, the indiscretion. I, I tend to agree with that. So that kind of covers the basics of IDPA stage design. If you have any questions, uh, comments, uh, you think I interpreted a rule wrong, you can go ahead and uh, contact us. Send us an email at powerfactorshow.gmail.com. Go to the website at powerfactorshow.com. Uh, hang on one second. I got Steve on the phone. Yeah? Okay. Steve says he's tired of working at Burger King and wants to come back. We've got Steve working at Burger King right now to help support the show. Yeah, so please sure, Steve. hit that donate button if you want to see Steve back on the show. Yeah, absolutely. And if you've got comments for the show, you can also send them to us at facebook.com slash powerfactorshow. Thanks again for watching, guys.